everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and you know what time of the week it is. It's Friday, Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. Just get smooth with it. Just get smooth. And the reason we're all getting down is because, of course, it's time for my favourite time of the week. It's time to talk about my wrestlers of the week. I can't waste a lot of time with this intro because, man, it was a hard week and there are a boatload of honourable mentions to get through. So let's just... Let's just get straight into it. In no particular order, the honorable mentions, Sasha Banks finally retained a title that she'd recently won on SmackDown against Bayley, but now it looks like there's gonna be a new feud with Carmella. Uh, also, Hangman Page, great, great, ma- this shows how strong this week's been. Great, great match at full gear, but he lost, he blew his big chance, and on a week as competitive as this, I think that might just be enough to knock him out of the top 10. Unfortunately, Leon Ruff, the new NXT North American champion after a shock win over Johnny Gargano, of course, on Wednesday night. John Moxley for uh, retaining the AW World Championship in that main event of Full Gear. But I think that match taught us a little bit more about the challenger than it did the champion. More on that later on. I don't want to spoil the video too much, but I'm sure you can guess one of the top 10 now. Elsewhere, Jay White, shockingly, like the match wasn't as great as some of the matches this week, but in terms of bold booking decisions, this may have been the boldest of them all. Over in New Japan, right, Jay White beat Kota Ibushi, and Ibushi had won the G1 Climax, which gave him a briefcase. That briefcase is a title shot at Wrestle Kingdom in January, like the WrestleMania of New Japan Pro Wrestling. No one ever really loses that title shot once they've won it. Not this year, Kota Ibushi lost that to Jay White, so... Big controversial scenes there. Shingo Takagi, another good New Japan match. This was probably the best New Japan match of the past week, beating Minoru Suzuki for the Never Openweight Championship. Kenta, another big win in New Japan. That secures him over Hiroshi Tanahashi, by the way, the ace of the company. That secures Kenta number one contendership status for the North American, cha- or the US Championship, excuse me, currently held by John Moxley, I believe. Interesting. Phoenix for his wonderful losing effort on Dynamite against his brother this week, although he did lose. And uh, I just, I was gonna, no, I'll leave that a secret for when the video, I'll explain what I mean in a few minutes time. But that is it for the honorable mentions for now. So without any further ado, let's race ahead and get on to my number 10. My number 10 this week is Penta, picking up one point. Any other week, he would have picked up a lot more points. But uh, yeah, great match on Dynamite. Wonderful main event against his own brother. A rematch of their wonderful match just a week or two ago. Was it, was it only last week? I can't quite work it out. Yeah, I think it was last week. Either way, they had a great first match. This second match was almost like The Empire Strikes Back, the darker sequel. It was a lot, it was a lot uglier in a good way. They were, there was a lot of bad blood between the two of them. They were ripping at each other's masks. They were really laying in stiff shots. And the story was, as told very well on commentary, was that Eddie Kingston's gotten in their heads and got between them and, and made them forget who they really are. And then Penta just decided at one point, right, I've had enough of this, I'm taking over, I'm gonna win the match. And he did so with uh, three big impact moves in a row. He had a pack package pile driver on the apron, a Canadian destroyer on the outside, a second package pile driver in the ring, and that was enough to put Phoenix away. And by this point, you could basically just see their faces, like they were both almost completely unmasked because they just ripped at each other's, you know, masks. It was quite effective, really. So Penta picked up the win. Obviously, Eddie Kingston then came down and just kicked Phoenix out the ring and was like, Penta, you're my best friend, brother. That's not a good New York accent in the slightest. And then, you know, Pac obviously made his big return. I suspect we'll be seeing Pac maybe pick up a few more points in the coming weeks if he manages to get some big showcase matches. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to that feud going forwards between Pac and Eddie Kingston. It seems like maybe they'll be reforming Death Triangle, the, uh, the exciting trio that got cut short by the lockdown and Pac having to go back to England. But now that Pac, Penta and Phoenix could all be on the same page again, I think they could put on some amazing six-man matches. But for now, Penta, you are my number 10 this week. One point for you, well done. No fear and all the rest of it. Number nine this week, I've just mentioned him and I mentioned as well in the honorable mentions, I kind of alluded to him being on this top 10. Uh, Number nine this week is Eddie Kingston. Eddie obviously took part in the full gear main event, the I quit match against John Moxley. And at first I wasn't gonna put him on the top 10. Similar to my logic with Hangman Page. I was thinking, well, he lost the match though. He blew his big shot. Does he deserve any points when it's been such a competitive week? But then I kind of snapped to my senses and realized, yes, of course he does. Everything he did in the build up to that match was superb. And it was quite a short feud as well. It didn't have the most development in the world, but man, Kingston managed to wring every ounce of emotion out of it. From his, you know, his, his pre-show interview in his lovely North Face coat, and he's just so intense uh, and almost silent by how intense he is. He's the best promo in wrestling right now for my money. Also, also man, the, the, the match itself was vicious and grisly, 
but Eddie Kingston really thrives in that sort of environment. And I was thinking, obviously, how are they going to do this where one of these ultra tough competitors can realistically quit the match without losing any credibility? And I think pretty much they found a way to do it with Moxley doing the bulldog choke with the barbed wire, both suffocating and cutting with the barbed wire into Kingston's neck. It was a brutal spot. I think it makes sense that he would say I quit when that's going on. I don't think he loses anything from that. And then to cap it all off, his performance, charisma-wise, promo-wise, on Dynamite was superb as well, even though he didn't really set foot in the ring. He didn't have any matches on the show. So Eddie Kingston, man, big stuff there. I didn't really, unlike Matthew, and I feel really bad for him, I didn't really ever have true belief or even a shred of hope that Kingston was going to win this match. But man, he did a good job of trying to make us believe he was going to. Uh, and I think that deserves recognition. So Eddie Kingston, what a man. One of the wrestlers of the year, just in terms of his sudden emergence on a bigger platform than maybe he's used to, I have to give him recognition on this week's Wrestlers of the Week. Next up, number eight, somebody who did win their title match at AEW Full Gear, and it's none other than the new TNT champion and the face of TNT, apparently, Darby Allin. Darby's match with Cody wasn't the best match on the show, but it was a very high quality show. So it would have struggled, I guess, to be the best match on the show. But what it was, was still a very, very strong match and one which told a simple, but effective story. And, and Cody's matches tend to excel when it comes to that. But this wasn't the story of Cody, was it? It was the story of Darby Allin. I mean, Cody was, you know, showing emotions of his own, telling a story of his own, getting more and more frustrated that Darby wouldn't just stay down. But it was all about Darby's comeback and it was all about his fire and the fact that he pulled a victory seemingly out of nowhere right at the end when it looked like Cody had really beaten and bludgeoned him down. I love the trip spot with the weight belt, uh, which got a very close near fall. I love the coffin drop. I bit on that. I thought that was going to be the finish of the match. When Cody kicked out of the coffin drop, I thought, well, Darby's losing now. And then they went into that sequence of pinfall reversals, which Darby managed to kind of get out on top of and squeak out a three count. I thought that was perfect. I thought it was fantastic. You, can, you can't really expect Darby to win matches all the time against somebody like Cody, for example, by overpowering them, I suppose, or hitting them with more moves. Sometimes you've just got to squeak out a win. And that's what Darby did. And now he's the TNT champion. Interesting things moving forwards for Darby though, as we see that uh, obviously he's now involved with Team Taz. Cody is also involved in that feud, although Cody has said that he's not pursuing a rematch with Darby at this time. So it looks like it's going to be kind of a, a feud between Cody and Darby and maybe Will Hobbs involved as well. And on the other side, you've got, you know, Taz's boys, Ricky Starks and Brian Cage. And I'm excited to see what happens. I think a match between Darby and Cage could be really good. They've obviously clashed in the past. Ricky Starks and Darby have clashed in the past, but they've got good chemistry, all of them, with each other. So I'm not necessarily against this feud carrying on, but I would have liked to have seen maybe somebody else come out of the woodwork for Darby to face in his first feud as champion. At the same time, there's always time for that after he's put away Starks or Cage. If he survives their, their challenge, of course. Next up, number seven is Cash Wheeler. Um, obviously, number six, therefore, is going to be Dax Harwood, so I don't know whether to just, I might just lump these two together into one entry. Yeah, I'll talk about both. So Cash Wheeler, well done mate, very good. Dax Harwood, very good stuff as well. Now, first of all, I should explain why Dax Harwood gets one extra point. I just thought he played a bit more of a pivotal role throughout the body of the match with the hand injury and then that affecting them going forwards. On the whole, it was a very difficult performance to judge where one was better than the other. So just because of the more central role that he took, I have to give Dax Harwood the slight edge, the one point edge for that hand spot early on and the effect it had throughout the rest of the match. But let's not dumb down Cash Wheeler's involvement either. He was obviously instrumental in the finish of this match, going for a 450 going entirely against FTR's philosophy of no flips, just fists, and it cost him dearly. Went for the 450, uh, Matt Jackson rolled out the way, he hit the canvas, Matt Jackson, big super kick, Cash Wheeler was down and out, and FTR lost their tag titles, which I did not think was going to happen. Now, obviously, when the Young Bucks introduced that whole stipulation, if we lose, we never get another title shot, I didn't really bite on that. I thought, that's too simple. Surely there's going to be more of a conv convoluted or complicated thing going forwards, but no. It was just what it was, and I've learned my silly little lesson. I do feel bad for FTR. I think they probably are my favorite tag team around these days, especially since Kenny and Hangman broke up after the astounding title run they had. Before AEW was a thing, I think FTR were my favorite tag team around that sort of time as well. Their NXT run, fantastic stuff. And I'm just really sad that they've lost those tag belts. I feel like they'll get them back in the future, though. I feel like a rematch has to be on the horizon, maybe early next year. 
and we could see them win those belts again. But whether they do or not, you can't deny that FTR know how to structure and put on an epic tag match. I really love the callback as well to their amazing feud with DIY, Champa and Gargano in NXT. Quite a bold shout out, I didn't realize they were gonna do that, but they hit, you know, Champa and Gargano's finisher, the, the meat in the middle, the double strike to the kneeling opponent. And I just thought that was fantastic. It reminded me of their amazing match in Toronto, which is still one of my favorite matches ever, I think. Uh, but yeah, this, this was a great match. And once again, and I've mentioned this a few times already now, just sad they lost. But never mind, because going forwards, as I mentioned, I think they will get those belts back. And even if not, there are plenty of tag teams for them to have great feuds with. Uh, hopefully, AEW don't let them slide too far. I think they still deserve to be near the top of the division. But they didn't show up on Dynamite, of course. Tully was there managing Sean Spears, but yeah, FTR didn't show up. So I don't know what's kind of in the works for them, but hopefully it's something good. I feel like it's gonna be something good. Maybe it could be a six man, FTR and Tully against Death Triangle. That's an even matchup, right? Mm. Moving on now to number five this week, somebody I'm not too familiar with. We're talking about Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling, which just happened to put on an undisputed match of the year candidate this past week and it's a wrestler named Mizuki. Now Mizuki is regarded by many as one of the best wrestlers in Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling, but also isn't at that very top level yet in terms of success. You know, she hasn't won the big title, which she had a chance to this week and came up just short. I mean, in fairness, the belt has only been around since 2016. There have only been five unique champions. So I suppose the belt doesn't change hands or get passed on too much at this early stage of its life. It's still quite a heavily defended belt. But Mizuki had a big chance to, and almost did it in what many people are calling a five-star match. So I'd urge you to check it out if you haven't seen it already. Mizuki uh, playing, it was kind of, a, it was a face versus face encounter, but Mizuki was kind of the, the underdog, so therefore she was the bigger baby face of the two. I think it's probably fair to say. And she's wonderful. For somebody that I've never really seen wrestle much before, I was absolutely blown away by her performance here. Such a well-rounded wrestler, not afraid of a high flying move or two, fantastic when it comes to a strike. She kind of looks really innocent. She kind of looks like she wouldn't harm a fly. And then she gets in the ring and starts just booting people in the gut and coming off the top row. And I'm like, well, maybe she maybe she is capable of violence. Really good stuff there from Mizuki. Uh, as I mentioned, she didn't quite win yet. We often see this sort of booking in Japanese promotions where somebody's built up and built up and built up. And then just when you think they should win the title, they delay it further and they don't give us that payoff until maybe longer than what we actually think it should have been. I mean, we've seen that with the likes of, for example, Tetsuya Naito uh, in New Japan. We've seen that with the likes of, uh, oh man, Zeus in uh, All Japan. I still don't think he's had the run at the top of the card that he really truly deserves. You could maybe say the same for Ben K as well over in Dragon Gate, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a strange booking tendency that Japanese promotions have, and sometimes it works perfectly when it leads to a bigger and better storyline. Sometimes it can leave us feeling rather frustrated. A couple of examples there, though, that I just gave are people who have held the top title, and I just don't think maybe it was as fully explored as it could have been, or I'm waiting for them to get another reign in the future. Whereas in this instance, I feel like this story has yet to be played out as much, and that there is still plenty of time for Mizuki, who I believe is only 25, to, uh, to go on and achieve really, really great things, possibly even establishing herself as, as a new new ace figure in Tokyo Joshi Pro. She certainly has all the tools to do so. I guess you could just maybe argue that her youth and relative lack of experience is the only reason why maybe it's not gonna happen for her quite yet. But man, this is one to watch for the future. I think she's phenomenal and I hope to see her crop up a lot more on wrestlers of the week. Now on to number four, uh, Kenny Omega. I feel even worse now about not putting Hangman on this top 10, but it was the Omega show and it is gonna be the Omega show for a while yet. I see him becoming AEW world champion. I can see Hangman being the man who rises up to finally take it off him, but further down the line. I feel like Hangman's gonna go on a bit of a decline now and he's gonna have to like pick himself up and really fight through and, and you know become the man that he wants to be. I think it's gonna be a brilliant story if they do it well, uh, but for now, it's all about Kenny. The pair of them opened the show as well with their tournament final match, which took me completely by surprise. And it was a great match to kick things off too. High octane, high impact as well. Man, those power bombs on the ramp and on the stage on Omega looked really painful, but Omega got his own back with that Tiger driver, which looked awesome and dangerous. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can't stop Kenny Omega when he's on this sort of roll 
in terms of singles action. He's arguably maybe the best in the world still. One aspect of the match I really loved as well was the finish of the match, which was Kenny going for the one-winged angel, and it looked for all the world like Hangman was going to slip out, but instead, he's punching away, he's trying to defiantly stop Omega from hitting the move. Omega finally does hit the move, and I was just like, yes, that's going to be used in video packages surely down the line. And then we had that extra little storyline element, didn't we, when Omega came out to congratulate the Bucks on winning the tag titles, and just just at the side of the frame, Hangman's lurking inside one of the entrance tunnels, just having a little peek. I can't wait for where this is going to go. But first of all, because I'm getting ahead of myself there way too much, Omega needs to win the AW World title, doesn't he, from John Moxley on December 2nd. I think he's going to, but it could go either way. The fact that it's on a dynamite puts that in a little bit of doubt, but I think maybe to get more eyes on the product, they might do a massive title change on dynamite, especially because it's a little way to go until the next pay-per-view as well. We'll have to see where that goes, but for now, it's another great match from Kenny Omega. He's approaching somewhere near his New Japan best, although AEW's matches typically aren't as long as big New Japan matches, so he hasn't got as much time to kind of explore the medium as he'd like to. I sound like such a theatrical wanker there, to explore the medium, yeah? But that's very much the sort of wrestler Kenny Omega is. He views it as an art form. He does things in his matches which are really striking and make an impact, and I can't wait to see where this goes. Number three now, heading back to that match in Tokyo Joshi Pro, to the woman who won the match and kept a hold of her title, and is probably the biggest dog in the yard, the yard that is Tokyo Joshi Pro. It's somebody familiar to quite a lot of the Western audience because of her appearances in AEW, and I really want to see her back. She's Ross's favourite as well. My favourite was Riho, and I, I kind of, they both did really well, and then, you know, Riho shoved Yuka Sakazaki down, and that was never answered, and me and Ross still can't really talk about that. It's Yuka Sakazaki, and it, <clears throat> my voice is gone as well at the crucial moment after all that build-up. Let me try again. It's Yuka Sakazaki. God. Yes, Yuka Sakazaki stole her hearts, didn't she, when she bounded out onto the AEW stage with her crazy music and seeming to believe that she's a genie, she's a magical girl of some sort. Uh, but we've only really seen a condensed version of her in All Elite Wrestling. And I think to see the full version of Yuka Sakazaki, watch this match, man. Like, just to see her in a fully realized, big, long, epic title match as the favorite as well, as the champion, not a position we're used to seeing her in as, you know, people who've only seen her in AEW. I think this was phenomenal, and she's, I thought she was good anyway, she's a far better wrestler than I even imagined at first. Now this match almost got off to a disastrous start, as part of Yuka Sakazaki's attire fell away, almost leading to a wardrobe malfunction, but she managed to hold it together and then get that sorted, and luckily, it didn't put too much of a dampener on the match, and even if it had led to a longer delay while her attire got fixed, Man, they still would have made up for it because the whole match as a story was absolutely incredible. There's something easier about babyface versus babyface matches than there is about heel versus heel matches. MJF and Jericho did it pretty well, I think, at full gear, but this face versus face encounter, man, the fans were behind both. Yes, you know, Yuka was maybe the less popular of the two because she was the favorite, she was the champion, at least from my perspective, watching the match as an outsider. But at the same time, you know, you can't begrudge her this victory, and it was wonderful as well. Uh, well earned. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of people are giving it five stars. And the scenes after the match too, there were tears from both, they were hugging, they were, you know, taking pictures together. They really, this is the first step in what I think could be a phenomenal series of main event title matches if they carry on this feud, if Yuka gives her another, gives Mizuki, excuse me, another chance. But we'll have to wait and see. For now, I was just really impressed. I thought it was fantastic and I have a new respect, a new angle uh, to look at Yuka Sakazaki as an excellent wrestler. But now on to num right, so I did it with FTR before. I'm just gonna do two and one in the same in the same bit, I think. I'm just gonna because they're a tag team. And I will explain once again why I've put one tag team member ahead of the other. But first of all, I need to give a shout out to number two this week and number one, one of them is my wrestler of the week. It's obviously the new AEW tag team champions, the Young Bucks. So first and foremost, right, it kind of always had to happen, didn't it? They always had to win the tag belts. Um and that's just the way it is. But they did explain in the aftermath of this that they wanted to hold off for even longer, and it was Tony Khan who said, no, you should win it now. Um, I'm glad the Young Bucks didn't win the tag belt straight away and immediately establish themselves as the top dogs of the tag division, because where's the fun in that? Everyone knows how good the Young Bucks are. Everyone knows how accomplished they are. Let's give some other tag teams a chance to shine. They've kind of done that, and now it's their chance to, I think, elevate other tag teams while being champions on the course of this title reign. Um, I'll explain who I've put first now. Uh, I've put Matt Jackson first. He's my wrestler of the week. Nick Jackson is in second place. And it's hard. It's really hard to. For a lot of people who don't really understand the Young Bucks, uh, Nick is often the one who does the slightly crazier spots in a match. Matt is often the one who sells a bit more, 
has the kind of more overt storyline elements usually. Often he's the one carrying an injury in and Nick has to protect him. Uh, and that's just often, not always, but often the way it is. And that's the way it was here with Matt carrying that, you know, that ankle injury that FTR had inflicted upon him. That played a, a very crucial role in the match and led to such an element of drama, especially towards the end when FTR took off his boot and were really wrenching at the ankle and trying to get him to submit until Nick came back and made the save. Uh, because of that, because he was kind of the emotional heart of the story, I have to give the 10 points to Matt. And I, I hate dumbing down Nick's, you know, role in this match because he was phenomenal as well, which is why he gets nine points. But I just feel like Matt was the one who carried the story just a little bit more uh, and really gained sympathy through his selling and, and just all that sort of stuff. And, and I guess often, say the Young Bucks went and had a crazy spot first match that was also like a five-star match, and, and that was like the best match of that week. Then I'd be more likely probably to give Nick the 10 points because he excels more when it comes to just crazy athleticism. But in terms of this slower, slightly slower paced, storyline driven kind of thing, I think Matt is one of the best tag team wrestlers in the world right now when it comes to that element of it. And that's not to mention just the Young Bucks collective excellent performance throughout this match. I mentioned earlier that FTR did the whole uh, DIY double team move uh, and the Bucks had double team moves of their own, their own homages to the past, the twist of fate and the swanton bomb is one example of that. FTR I think hit a heart attack at one point as well. I think the Young Bucks hit a 3D at 1.2. There were so many different moves that harkened back to great tag teams of the past or, you know, in the case of in the case of DIY, the very recent past. And I think that, you know, it was very, very effective. But of course, the Bucks get the biggest scoop of points because they won. Bit of a terrifying booking decision for those who are critical of the Young Bucks to digest, I feel. Because understandably, I think a lot of people might see them because of their personas as people who are gonna just bury everybody. I can't see that happening. I think they're too sensible, and I think as EVPs, they're too invested in how the company looks and how the division looks as a whole, so as to let their egos get in the way of that. I don't think they will, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. But for now, congratulations to Nick Jackson, nine big points, but congratulations as well to Matt Jackson. You are my wrestler of the week. That's it for now. Now let's take a look at the big old league table and see what updates have happened there. So Cody still keeps a hold of his number one spot, but John Moxley is right behind and Shingo Takagi as well. They are in joint second place, but look at Kenny Omega storming back up to fourth position. All the top four now are on 60 points or above. And as we move a bit further down, we can see the likes of the usual suspects. Sammy Guevara is there, of course, who looks like he might have a key role coming up with MJF, tension in the inner circle. Kota Ibushi still there as well in joint 16th. Obviously, he recently lost his title shot to Jay White for Wrestle Kingdom. But because Wrestle Kingdom is a two-day affair in 2021, I can see there being a few more shenanigans here and there. We'll have to wait and see. So that's it for this week's Wrestlers of the Week. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from Coldaholic.com. Leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments section down below. Uh, stay safe out there as well, of course. Stay positive. Let me know if you see any good matches this coming week. Let me know about that. Tweet me at Jack the Jobber or leave a comment down below. And I'll see you very soon.